This podcast is brought to you by StarCharge, the largest EV charging manufacturer in the world, and is also a provider of residential and commercial battery storage and microgrid solutions. And KimPower, the reliable, quick, and scalable EV charging solutions for everyone and everywhere. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. I'm your host, Francie. Glad to have you plugging in with us today. I'm accompanied by Kyle Connor from Out of Spec, of course, and also we have a special guest today, John Volker, a well-known, reputable EV journalist, contributing editor at Car and Driver, one of the top EV journalists, we'd certainly say. John, welcome. It is great to have you here on the Out of Spec podcast. Fabulous to be here. We could all three probably talk about electric cars for several hours, which I think your editing software spares you. <laughs> yes, we really could. Honestly, before we even started this call, we were talking for a good bit because you have plenty of experience and knowledge, as does Kyle. We're all curious, could talk for hours. And you've covered so much in the electric vehicle space, really tremendous coverage, I'd say. And just yesterday, you published an article with Inside EVs titled, How GM's Ultium electric car revolution went off the rails, where you dive into how GM hoped to usurp Tesla as the leader of EVs in America, but that obviously has not happened. And you dove in, into the sources, into the details to figure out exactly what has gone wrong. And for a bit of background, you know, GM had a lot of claims for their electric goals, as they're not the only automaker either to do that, and lofty goals. And it seems like there were some major multiple pieces that stood in the way of reaching those goals. And everyone, audience, you need to go read John's article probably before even listening to this podcast. We will have the article linked in the show notes. It's published on Inside EVs. We love them. They're a friend. They're going through a huge, awesome revamp over you know what their topics they're covering, really relevant to consumers and stories like this. So definitely go over there, read through all of John's hard work because it was a lot of hard work and all of the details of what he's found, and then come back here. I'll let you leave. <laughs> okay, welcome back. <laughs> so first off, John, I want to know, how did you go about researching this story specifically? GM hasn't been terribly forthcoming with the reasons behind, you know, their stop sales and slowdowns and delays, but they have told us a bit about the problems. Where did you start? And maybe why did you start with this story? Well, it's something that we all talk about, right? You know, you kind of expect it. So I went to EV Day, March 2020, last plane flight I took for 16 months before lockdown. And GM had a dozen cars there. They talked about Ultium. They showed us the modules, the cells, the packs, you know, full day deep dive. Great. Then comes lockdown. But we assume that this is chugging along in the background and so on. Then comes the Hummer. And they did actually deliver one in 2021. One. And so, <laughs> all right, great. That's proof of concept. It proves that electric cars can be badass. Fine. You know, get to the volume stuff. Where are the Chevys? Where are the trucks? You know, all right. And Cadillac comes first. Okay. Lyric, great. They're going to move that forward by nine months. It's already in China and so forth. And then the cars didn't come and the cars didn't come and the cars didn't come. And it's been 18 months that I think we've been sort of talking to other people about other journalists, people we know at GM, what's going on. And every, and so Mrs. Barra has had now three quarterly meetings where she has in essence said variations on, we're not where we hope to be and we're disappointed. Yeah, indeed. Um, and so I wanted to do a story on this. And as you, you talked about the new regime at Inside EVs, I work with Patrick George, the editor at a variety of outlets. We work very well together. And he, I had the great good fortune where he said, what's a story you'd like to do? And I said, I want to figure out WTF is going on with Ultium, right? And he said, okay, great, go do it. So I talked around, no one would go on the record. And this is kind of like a four-part series I did previously called Charging is Changing, where obviously it's a thing that everybody talks about, but it's so sensitive and the sources don't want to burn their business contacts. 
And so everyone wants to talk, everyone wants to unload, no one wants their name associated, which is tough for a legit journalist. And this sort of came to be the same thing. And I had a version of it. And I kept going back to GM and saying, okay, answer this question. Okay, that's not an answer. A, B, C, give me, and so on. And so there were a lot of iterations of that. And finally, something clicked. And they said, do you want to talk to Anderson? And I said, yep, absolutely. And that made it a much richer article because A, it meant that we actually had what I think is the most detailed description of how Ultium modules are actually built, which was interesting to me because I don't know enough about manufacturing that having seen one on a table, I couldn't take it apart, say how you build it. And so I took away a couple of things from that. Number one, everybody assumed right, that it was the cell plant. GM and LG together, Ultium Cells LLC, first plant in Warren, Ohio. Everyone calls it Lordstown, but it's not. Um, second plant in Spring Hill. Third one in Flint, is it? Where's the third one? I forget, it's not live yet. Um, okay, great. And I think they were gonna do one in Mexico. I don't know if that's still going on, but um, everybody assumed because getting cells, and I have friends within LG, friends within Tesla, getting cell plants up to profitable yield is, to quote one battery engineer, really, 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 really hard. There were seven reallys, I counted. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think everybody assumed that was the problem. According to multiple sources, that's not the problem. The Warren, Ohio plant is now up there. It's doing what it needs to do. They're, if anything, probably overproducing cells. It was this problem with assembling the modules. And I had originally said they were hand stuffing them. The, the word stuffing is apparently not a good thing to say to a battery engineer, so duly noted. Um, but they, started out at five modules an hour for this entire process where you have the base plate, you put the thermal glue on it, essentially. Um, you have a top and the four sides, obviously. I Read the article. You'll see the whole description in there. But they could not get it up to speed, and they couldn't get it up to speed for more than 12 months. And... I didn't explicitly say in the article, but I think what surprises everyone is, guys, you're the Detroit 2.5. You're supposed to know how to build stuff. Use machine tooling. We never did find out what the initial company that did the automated assembly of the module is. I had a source I trust say, rather than going to a company that had done this before, had built other modules for other automakers or an LG, they went to a more traditional tier one supplier. I don't know because I asked the question a lot of ways and GM is not talking about who it was. They did say there's more than one supplier and there was a news story that just came out this morning naming a new supplier. But quite frankly, I don't know if it really matters. I just want to know did you go to like, I don't know, I think Delco Remy doesn't exist anymore, but one of the traditional kind of people that make gear sets or whatever to do that? And if so, why? And the offset is China, because in China, the Ultium modules are coming together just fine. And they've sold over 100,000 Ultium vehicles there so far. Now, granted, different cells, right? Prismatic instead of pouch or LFP blades, but still their assembly equipment worked just fine. So what the hell happened in North America? Will we ever find out? I don't know. Well, I, first of all, I just want to commend you on your work because this is the stuff that moves the industry forwards. I think it gets everyone talking the same language, investigative reporting. Awesome. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I, John, you know me. I'm a video guy. I don't read a lot of articles. This was 
truly a fascinating read. So it was really Wait, captivated by it. Nice work. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 I know. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Just to clarify some things, mm -hmm. the issues were not with the cell production, which is what we had all assumed and we all said was they can't get cells made. But that wasn't the case. They were cranking out cells. And in fact, in your article, you said they were even exceeding their high expectations yeah. for cell manufacturing. The actual assembly of the module was what was holding it up. Now, I have some experience with this. I went to, of course, Magna is a, a supporter of out of spec. Magna makes the battery enclosures for GM vehicles, specifically the dual double stacker that the Silverado uses and the Hummer uses. I've been in that plant. I spent two days in that plant. Uh, and they were producing, I forget the number, maybe 60 a day or 80 a day or something like that. This was very early on before we knew they were going to have production problems. Um, you know, I was going through all the laser weldings, which turned out, I guess, had to get recalled because it wasn't a good process. But there was a lot of advancement in engineering and production of the enclosure. Mm. But so that was really a fascinating thing. So it sounds like the enclosure line was okay, maybe they had some issues with sealing on the first trucks, but that was solid and going. The mm -hmm. cell production was solid and going. They just couldn't get the modules put together, which seems like a very, from the outside looking in, simple thing. It shouldn't have taken a year and a half. What's your impression of what were the steps they took? Do you know what steps they took to try and speed up production? What was the quality like? Where was actually the holdup in all of this? I couldn't get to one specific holdup. I will admit I have a little bit more appreciation for what it takes to do fully automated, high volume assembly of a fairly large module. Nine kilowatt hours is a big module. And, you know, the cells themselves are big. But um, my understanding in talking to Anderson was they did tweaks essentially in every part of the process. Um, some examples would include making sure that this thermally conductive glue is applied in the right place at the right thickness, not over applied, not under applied, but within its boundaries. Um, bending the tabs on the cells through the frames that hinge down from the top cover of the module. And he talked about having to go back with production engineers module designers, battery engineers, and tweak some of the specs to look at tolerances, things like that. It's all essentially standard production engineering. I asked him at the end, so, okay, let's, let's make, you, make you the gods for a moment. If you had a do-over, what would you do? And he didn't give me a specific thing, but he indicated that, you know, Part of the challenge was we had such high volume projections right out of the box. And that seemed fair to me because if you look at what Mrs. Barra was saying less than two years ago, in terms of hundreds of thousands of EVs sold by the end of last year, Ultium EVs, um, sold by the end of last year, that's a really steep ramp from, I don't think they ever made more than what, 70,000 volts a year, something like that. And that was doubling the capacity from the original plant. So I think had they not had such a steep ramp, we might not be having this conversation, but the assignment they were given was, okay, from day one in sometime in early 2022, you gotta sell, for, you gotta produce, the modules for 400,000 EVs. And some of those EVs have gigundo packs because they're massive, heavy vehicles. So there's that's a lot of modules. Well, that's what I was going to ask about. Part of the problem from my side was, yes, they were very constrained. Okay, so big project projections. We got it. Hard to manufacture modules. Got that. They were the initial Ultium EVs that GM brought out, Hummer EV being the first one. This is the most thirsty vehicle with the biggest need for the biggest battery that's ever been put in a series production electric vehicle. 
Do you think that that approach compounded the problem in terms of deliveries? Because, you know, now they're putting essentially two very large battery packs in one vehicle. Uh, what, what's your what's your approach on that? Should they have launched with an Equinox first or something that needed a lot fewer batteries? Well, um, great question. And I have at least two parts to the answer. Um, the first one is that traditionally new technology comes in at the high end of the market, either in ultra luxury or in sports and performance. And the Hummer is sort of in there, but you know, that's a hundred thousand dollar vehicle, right? It's easier to get to profitability quicker by selling X amount of Hummers than selling three X the same amount of Equinox EVs. The margins are just higher. And we do know of GM that under Mrs. Barra, the company has remorselessly prioritized making a profit over volume, over being in every market, over having a full range of vehicles. You know, they do a much smaller number of things now, but all of those things are profitable. So that's number one, why do the big one first? But that said, I think we need to have some perspective on the Hummer. It is an outrageous vehicle in a lot of ways. I enjoyed driving it, even though I had to drive up over some shrubbery to test charge it. Um, Sorry, Electrify America, it was an old charging station and the cable wasn't long enough. But um, the Hummer was never going to be a high volume thing. You know, 100,000 reservations, wonderful, groovy, go wild. But I actually, when the Hummer came out, I looked at the whole Hummer Gen 1 stuff. And in the highest volume Hummer year, when they had three separate vehicles, you know, a handful of military derived H1s, the H2, which was a Silverado underneath, and the H3, which was sort of the cheap high volume Hummer based on a Colorado, sort of. Um, the total sales for Hummer in its best year ever were about 70,000. This is not a high volume brand. It is the most in your face brand you could have until a certain vehicle came out of a certain plant in Texas anyway. And um, it was never going to be something that they would sell 10,000 a month. I just don't think it was. The Lyric, I don't know about 10,000 a month because Cadillac sells this much compared to say Lexus, but the Lyric I think was going to be their first quasi volume entry. And then the Silverado. The Silverado I think was really where GM felt they were going to sell volume, but the Lyric was first because it uses half as much pack. Totally agree on all of your points. Hummer is just, I think, a demonstration of what they're capable of, and then they can like pull parts out of that and package you know, all the other uh, vehicles off of it. But one thing I want to come back to is I'm not a great company analyst at all. I just stick to the cars, but in your article, you brought up a fair point, which is even through all of this, in our weird EV bubble, GM has been, what is going on over there? They're losing it, whatever. They can't build these cars. But the stock price has remained stable. So what would you say to that? Because I think a lot of our audience, including me and Francie and everyone, we live in the EV world. Mm -hmm. What is the general response to the Ultium delays? Because it doesn't seem to be affecting the stock price uh, heavily. Back in the day, you used to have what you called widows and orphan stocks which were essentially safe stocks, you know, not as safe as say bonds or T-bills, but stocks that delivered a decent um, yield every year, a decent dividend, and were clearly companies that would never go out of business. And GM was one of those for 75 plus years, you know, GM was always going to be there. And it continues to behave like that kind of stock, despite, I think, the burning desire of its executives and its stockholders for GM to get a little bit of the stratospheric and, it, to my way of thinking, inexplicable valuation of Tesla. You know, Tesla was the most valuable car company on the planet. I think there was a point at which it was worth more than the entire rest of the world's industry added together. I may be wrong on that. Certainly the rest of the US industry. Um, it's come down considerably from there. Um, you know, 
people like me have been writing that really Tesla, you know, at some point the laws of gravity are going to apply because I don't believe that Tesla will make 50 million cars a year at any point in the given future, um, owning half the world's auto market. But um, GM and Ford and all of those guys desperately want some portion of that. We can do EVs. EVs are cool, advanced tech. And by the way, we also bought crews. We can do autonomous vehicles. And we are going to squeeze extra money out of our buyers by having all of these digital services. You know, the goal for many of those announcements, in addition to pioneering technology, was to get the stock price up. The point of what I wrote, and the financial analyst got it, was GM stock price hasn't risen in 10 years, which is not a great thing because inflation has gone up and all the rest. It remains a very profitable company, but I think what that says is the street remains to be convinced that GM knows what it's doing in EVs. And I think, you know, I would have said this about 2023, but it didn't happen. I think 2024 will be a pivotal year because if GM has not shipped six figures of Ultium EVs by the end of 2024, I think it will look really bad for them. It looked pretty bad last year, quite frankly. 13,000 Ultium EVs. <laughs> I, I have to agree that it's, you say that they, you know, if they don't ship out six figure of these EVs, but I don't even see that really happening. I mean, maybe they could do it, but it's, it seems to be a trend with legacy automakers to severely overpromise, like to make these very lofty goals, whatever it might be, like 100% EV by 2030, and then they step back, or like, we're going to build these battery manufacturing plants, and then they step back, we're going to invest this much, and then they step back, whatever the problem is. Mm-hmm. Why? Like, and it, it's not successful, right? GM has had a bad year. Their EV stories continuously are a big old question mark. Their decisions, you know, with even Apple CarPlay and Android. And then it seems just really confusing to me. And, you know, you've been in this space longer and you've seen the legacy automakers and how they function. Mm-hmm. But why, I don't, why wouldn't they take from the new playbook instead? Why would they stick to old old ways of doing things and specifically this like insular way of doing it, which I've, you noted with GM and specifically, you know, this tier one supplier that did not have the direct experience. Why why do you think they're being, they've chosen to be so insular and will they, do you think, (laughs) turn outward and recruit that external expertise that is required in my opinion to make a difference and actually get to the numbers that they need to be in significant electric vehicle player? It's a great question. And Mrs. Barra said in one of the analyst briefings that she regretted not bringing in the software team. They now have about a dozen highly placed executives from Apple, from Google and the like. She regrets not bringing them in considerably earlier. Um, Similarly, they just hired Kurt Kelty, who ran Tesla's battery efforts for a decade plus or minus. Um, I had the great good fortune to interview Kurt in about 2009, I think. I'd have to go back and check. Um, We were both a little younger then. But um, I will share with you, this didn't go in the article, but um, one of the Tesla people I know said, remember how Panasonic said it took four years for the Nevada Gigafactory, their piece of it, to be profitable. Kurt is responsible for that. He used to work for Panasonic. He negotiated with them. And I thought, oh, that's a good skill. Um, So I will be curious to see how GM suppliers react to some of that. But um, one of the problems I've always sort of identified with Detroit. And because I live in a place that isn't America, which is to say New York, um, a lot of the people don't take it seriously. But Detroit and the industry is very insular because the way people buy cars there and in the non-coastal, most of the non-coastal parts of America, it's very different from the way people buy cars. California is obviously a huge huge progressive force in terms of reducing pollution 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I have this argument with a former colleague who says essentially, you know, not every person on the face of the planet has as their ideal life owning a detached house on two acres and towing a 14,000 pound boat four and a half hours to the lake house behind a turbo diesel 20 foot long pickup every weekend. That's just not all that relevant to the rest of the world's auto industry. The Detroit two and a half are really good at building those vehicles. Those vehicles are like the K cars of North America. K cars being the tiny Japanese cars limited in width, length, height, and power um, that are hugely popular in Japan due to regulatory preferences and irrelevant to the rest of the world. Now, we happen to make a couple million of those big pickup trucks, so it'll last for a while. But I worry about all of the Detroit makers having pulled back from the rest of the world, especially because it is quite clear from the point of view of the Chinese government that they have now served their purpose and they should go home now, please. So, so that brings up a question. Let's say they solve the module issue, which it sounds like they're well on their way to, okay, maybe the real production issues are go- coming out. Uh, I, I spoke to the Honda people, same people you spoke to. They are overly confident that they can get 40,000 year one and 70,000. Did you get the I was amazed. Thing? They were like, yeah. there is no question. We're getting those cars. Okay. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, everyone I spoke to, it. I don't know if there was a briefing before the thing or if they truly believe <laughs> that they could get was. that many. Yeah, of course, yeah. but it, that was that was a huge shock. I'm like, okay, well, GM's got all these issues. Wh- how are you feeling about the partnership? They're like, we're totally confident. Software's on our own track. Blah 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 blah. Can we talk about the cars for a second? Let's say the production stuff does get solved. Yeah, is there enough? So the. Uh, I agree with you, John, that the EV market is not slowing down. I can also just look at the interest in EVs from our viewership numbers only increasing, the the topics getting stronger. And I think there's this wave of EVs are dying, no demand. We we just did a story on Mercedes, but you know, not having enough demand. But are their cars actually that desirable right now? All of these questions come up. Uh, does GM have the right products to sell that for this volume? Is the Blazer, is the Equinox, are the Honda Prologue, Acura ZDX, Silverado EV, Hummer EV, which is a low-volume showcase, but are these the right products at the right time? What's your opinion? I think the answer differs a little bit depending on product. Hummer, the Halo, whatever. I Four years ago, I wrote an article that said the Hummer has only one mission, to prove EVs are badass. Done. Ticked off. Fine. Um the Lyric, nice enough car. Um, Cadillac is doing an interesting job of reinventing itself. But as, as I keep having to point out, they sell more Cadillacs in China than they do in North America and have done for almost 10 years. So you have to view any vehicle from Cadillac that is sold in both markets as much as a addressing a Chinese market. Um, and Cadillac is just not that huge a force at this moment, numerically, in the U.S. market, again, compared to Lexus. Um, but the Chevrolets. So I tend to think that Ford had the right track in making an F-150 that drops more easily into fleet usage. The word upfitting is something I heard a lot about at the F-150 lightning drive and not at all from GM in regard to the Silverado, or or as um, some of the old people call it, the Evalanche, Evalanche. Um, I know one, I know one auto writer who will get one and immediately rebadge it because he has an old one. But um, the SUVs, the Blazer, and the Equinox, to me, are the important volume play. We'll see what Silverado does. But I think choosing that form factor limited the upside. Don't know. We'll see. Um, But I very much want to drive a Blazer. I very much want to drive the Equinox. And um, even at 35, I mean, I am not holding my breath for a $30,000 Equinox, 
But even at 35, given that the average vehicle transacts at 47,000 now, down from 48,000, um, a $35,000, 250 to 300 and something compact SUV, although it's a big compact SUV, is actually worthwhile. Plus, I think the, the last factor, Silverado has been on TV a lot. Um, the Hummer is sort of a known quantity at that point. The Lyric is the Lyric. I have not seen a ton of Blazer EV marketing for very obvious reasons, nor for the Equinox. They will be fresh product at a point when the rest of the industry is actually in a cadence. We haven't had a lot of fresh volume EVs for a while, right? So the EV9 is coming. And I think that's going to be huge. Very good vehicle. Hyundai Kia continues to impress. Um, whenever the EX30 arrives, the Volvo in the sort of mid 30s to mid 40s, although it's a very small car, that's an essentially an unusable rear seat. So if you've got a $35,000 base Volvo that's really only for two people, or you've got a $35,000 base Equinox where four people will sit, that may be a compelling thing. And, you know, once the bolt went away and it was a compact hatchback and most Americans won't even think about compact hatchbacks, you know, utility vehicle labels or not. Um, if it reads as an SUV, it's fully electric. If you can get 300 miles of range in one of the models, I think people will consider it. One of the things that I'm shocked no one picked up in, in that article is that if GM actually sells a quarter million or produces, they said 200,000 to 300,000 GM brand Altiums, and then add to that the 40,000 Hondas, right? So we could probably a quarter of a million on the bottom end, we could be looking at over 300,000. That's a couple points more of EV market share right there with every other maker doing exactly what they did last year. So. GM's absence out of 2023 actually depressed EV sales or what I suspect were their natural level, always assuming that Chevy dealers can sell the damn things. Right. Well, that we could do a whole nother podcast on okay. the whole dealer equivalent, but it does seem mm -hmm. like once this problem is solved, we are due for a wave of GM electric vehicles. Absolutely. And there's also, of course, the next gen, next gen bolt coming uh, at some point. Uh, is what we're told. So I think that'll have an LFP battery pack and should be priced pretty cheap. What's your impression here's of that? Here's the thing. Where are they going to get those LFP batteries? Yeah, probably China. What do you think? Well, and that automatically means the most price sensitive EV in their lineup does not get the incentive. Yeah, yeah we'll see. I mean, they haven't announced where yet officially no. the batteries are coming from. So maybe they'll have something. Do in you the have US a sense? I because I don't. We no, know what either. Ford no, was no. going to do for LFP batteries, and they're having some challenges with Yeah, that. massive, mm -hmm. yeah. But. Yeah, I mean, I would think that they would, I don't know, do you, they had so much issues, not necessarily, right? It's with the casing, with the box, that's what you said. With from more GM the, side. From the, the GM side of thing. thing, yes. So do you think they would just avoid all problems now and be like, okay, we're going to hand it over to the experts, even if it's China, who cares, like, no, That's, they're they, they're going to get that sorted and they're going to rip that automated line, is my guess. GM no, is I China thinking, for something different. Yes. Over half the GM vehicles sold in Mexico now are made in China, which almost no one recognizes. Didn't know mm -hmm. that. The gasoline vehicles. Um, yeah. I think GM, probably correctly, sees the future technology and the one that it has to own more importantly and build itself as electric. And so it's China knows very well that it has the lowest cost LFP batteries and Chinese companies setting up in the U S to build them and sell them to domestic makers are their own problem. We will see what happens with any further or tighter, um, mm -hmm. import restrictions, IRA style, rules on sourcing of metals, minerals, and um, processing. So aside from the battery stuff, there was one last topic I wanted to bring up, which is software. Yep. Um, you know, there uh, Blazer uh, sounds like there is a fix is what I'm hearing. Uh, so it's we're getting very close to seeing Blazer EVs hit the road. What What's your impression of, 
I know your story was mostly on battery pack, but I'm treating it as a, you know, also the overall picture of why did GM's thing slow down in terms of producing vehicles. Sure. Software is a big component right now for the vehicles that are hitting the road, most specifically Blazer EV with a stop sale. And I believe the vehicles coming out of Mexico are no longer affected by this software is what I've been told. Um, so they just need to update the ones on the dealer or that have been produced. What, what's your impression of the software in the conversations you had with people at GM? What are they saying? What's, what's the vibe over there? It's a great question, actually, because some of the conversations I've had with GM and others subsequent to the article hitting yesterday morning included that there are actually three different places where there are software problems or there have been. Um, one is the infotainment, getting rid of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, um, which is apparently not actually the dating factor in what caused the stop sale. Um, although I'm happy to be corrected on that because that was a background comment only. So if anyone has information that in fact it was the problem, let me know. Let Kyle know first, let Francie know first. But um, so you've got that whole infotainment side of things. You have charging software, and I had an entire chunk on charging problems with Ultium, and I just didn't include it. It was going to make the article too sprawly. And then the third part is embedded software, the stuff that you know runs controllers to do all the rest of what the car does. And I'm told that actually the newest electrical system had embedded software problems. They can be corrected with over-the-air updates. And thankfully, none of my sources said software-defined vehicle. I was going to have to drink if they did. But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but that the problems with software may have been some combination of embedded systems and charging with perhaps this mystery new awesome GM interface that makes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto completely irrelevant, uh, which I haven't seen, <laughs> um, not being the main problem. Um, even well, we also was. know that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the current generation of Ultium integrates perfectly because the Prologue has it. And that is the exact same car underneath as a Blazer. Same controllers, yeah. same everything. So, yeah, I, well, I have never really... Some of the same controllers. I don't know which controllers. My source wouldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. you know, is it a controller for safety systems? Is it a controller that's somewhere sitting between the infotainment and the rest of the car? Don't know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what what I'd love to do is is make an open invitation to GM on this podcast is to say, come on, John can come back. Let's talk software. Tell us what's going on. Tell it, you know, sure. let's let's have an open, candid conversation because it's hard for us to guess from the outside looking in. And to be totally honest, we, uh, Francie and I were at the Chicago Auto Show and we actually had to cut some clips out of the video because we assumed things that were totally incorrect. And it was the first time we've received some communication from GM who watched the video and was like, hey, that's not accurate. You know, th they were super cool about it. And I was just like, I don't have any ability to know this stuff unless you tell us. So right. please come on the show and, you know, set the record straight. Let's tell the story. Sounds like we're coming into a positive year for GM in terms of vehicles, manufacturing, and also software. Seems like things are getting all sorted. We, we'd we love to be the outlet to, uh, you know, tell that story. Look at Kyle being so optimistic here. This is really a First change time. of events. First yeah, time. I mean, Kyle, what have you done with him? Yeah, he's having woke up on the right side of the bed today. But um, I do think it's just interesting to see the, the the stark contrast between startup EV automakers and the legacy EV automakers that are moving into the space and how disruptive decisions from like GM are quite different than the disruptive strategies that we see from the startups, like removing Apple CarPlay. Why is that disruptive? Making things, you know, trying to build it out from internally before going external. Hmm. You know, these interesting, very stark differences between them. But, you know, we all seem optimistic that they're going to fix these problems. They don't have a choice. Right. But um, I, I remain uh, a skeptic for those 200 plus thousand EVs by the end of 2024, just mm. from what I've seen in the EV space. But John, do you do you mirror Kyle's optimism here? Um, like all good journalists, I'll come down somewhere in the middle. Um, I think 
My gut, just from dealing with automaker engineers and communications people for 15 years, is that I would not have been able to write that article in as informed a way if GM hadn't gotten to a confidence level. Um, I had started to get feelings for that sometime late last year, but obviously the Q4 numbers were not great. I mean, bless his heart, one of the comms people did say, look, Q4 sales were double Q3, but okay, great. Going from 3,000 to 6,000 is not where we were going to be 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, what they did say, though, and I did put this in the article, is Cadillac has consistently, apparently, for December and January, sold 2,000 or 1,900 lyrics, which is 20% of all the Cadillacs they sell in a month. So, you know, that that is a decent amount for an electric car, given whatever Cadillac's audience is. And I don't know a lot about its demo and psychographics these days. But um, I think them giving numbers like that when GM does not talk about monthly sales anymore, just quarterlies, just suggests that, okay, they finally think their head's above water. And they do have the ability, if they get the software right, to start cranking these out. I was surprised that they've actually been building lots and lots and lots of blazers. They're in lots somewhere in Mexico. And once they get the software right, those are all gonna hit dealers. My local dealer, who was going to get their Blazer in early October, still has it on indefinite hold because I check in every so often. But um, it could happen. And I think we're in late February now. I think a couple months from now, we'll know because those cars, all three of us, will have seen those cars show up on lots, will be offered test drives. They'll be in the media fleets. There will be a bucket ton of Blazer EV stuff. Hope to see it. <laughs> John, I just wanted to say before we wrap up the show, congratulations again on that awesome piece. You always uh, hit it out of the park with your uh, crazy deep dive stories and you do it right. You get the right sources, old school, traditional journalists, not just Kyle over here spitting false stuff left and right on the internet. So can't thank you enough. I, you know, the industry wouldn't be what it is without you and uh, love to have you on the show. So uh, yeah, thanks. You're very again kind. I piece. just wish I had your energy. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. The well, volume just, of video you guys put out is astounding. Hey, we got to keep up. We got to, you know, ultimately we have to, uh, we want to win at this thing. So it's full send sure. and uh, we're well, powered by Starbucks. To, do I get 15 seconds to pitch the side hustle? Tempting fate tours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Go, to you, go ahead. You. When I'm not being an EV journalist, I'm driving stupid, unreliable old cars around the country. Um, which is fun in its own different way. Um, it's called Tempting Fate Tours, just YouTube slash Tempting Fate Tours. Um, watch our videos and um, leave us comments. We love comments, as you guys do. We should do a collaboration one day where we get the worst EVs and do something with them. It's a deal. Okay, all right. right. We are taking the Coda and maybe the 58 <laughs> Riley. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let, let, uh, that'd be well, amazing. We should do something. Yeah. <laughs> well, all, oldest EVs that you can find. And then I just met someone who has a 18 or 19, oh, something 1910, somewhere around there, Detroit electric, oh, pretty yeah. much unused in their garage. Oh. Uh, and I just bought two cars from this lady. So I'm like, maybe I should pick one of those up too. That'd be kind of cool. They're fascinating because they don't have rheostats. They go relay by relay. So acceleration, Interesting. clunk, clunk, clunk. Ah, cool. My, uh, I have two commuter cars that are that way as well. Oh. So, yeah. Well, my buddy Tom Rimes, who's the other half of Tempting Fate Tours, has a Sebring City car oh, from great. 1976 that's now pretty much restored. And we're going to be restoring one of mine back to perfect, and then another one we're dropping a Tesla drive drain in, and we're going to make it do wheelies. You do realize those are trailer <laughs> tires on there. Yeah, we got to get some big fat boy tires and actually put some weight in it to get it to hook up. But they're on uh, the rear end, clearly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be funny. We've got all the weird EVs over here, so you know, come come on out sometime too. Attempting Fate Tours EV Edition. This actually could be hilarious. perfect. 
Yeah, <laughs> that would be fun. This is everything I'd live yeah. for. This would be amazing. I love to hear that you're doing that. And we'll make sure to link everything in the show notes so that everyone can find it. And yeah, John, really a, a, a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to speak to you about My this. God. And uh, thank you so much for coming on to the Out of Spec podcast and for your time and energy and telling us not only what you found in this story, but how you went about it, because I'm, I'm sure it was not easy to find all of this out. It hasn't been easy for anyone. Thank you. Well, thank you. Here's to the next one. Here's to the next one. Thank you, everyone, also for plugging into the Out of Spec podcast today. Hope you have an electrifying rest of your day. We'll see you next time on the next episode. Bye-bye.